annual uh, Creek Bible Studies Conference. Yes! <laughs> so, uh, so, the Creek Bible Studies Conference, I'll tell you a little bit about the history, I'll tell you a little bit about ICAST, and then we're going to get going. We, on each panel, we have three individuals. Each individual will have approximately 25 minutes to speak, and then there will be questions, comments, um, um, at the very end. So if you do have comments or questions, please feel free to like take notes so um, we can move along. Um, everybody is approximately here. Uh, if not, we're Skyping in. Uh, John Lubinacci and Mary Lubinacci tomorrow. Uh, Drew Winter from Europe is going to be Skyping in. And everyone else uh, should be coming in um, and out. The bathrooms, uh, gender specific bathrooms are right across the hall. Uh, gender fluid or uh, non-conformist gender um, bathrooms are downstairs um, and they're accessible. Um, if you need an elevator at any time, the elevator is right over there just to go out the exit and um, so feel free to do that. Uh, we will have um, lunch but it will be on you all and we'll just go down to catering. Um, most universities now, if you are in a university or college, um, the catering system has a monopoly on food and it's really difficult and uh, organizing the, these conferences is um, it's probably better to kind of push uh, Sodexo and uh, our mark and all this to promote a vegan diet or uh, you know a plant-based diet um, at whatever you want to identify as. Uh, so my name is Anthony, I'm one of the co-founders of ICAST Institute for Critical Studies, founded in 2001 to challenge uh, the extreme repression uh, by uh, law enforcement and the, uh, you know, the corporate industrial complex um, towards radical as well as grassroots animal rights organizations um, in the United States after uh, the Patriot Act. And so we were founded in 2001, uh, post um, approximately that time period, post you know, September 11. And uh, we wanted to give legitimacy and credibility to grassroots organizations that were getting a lot of repression. And still to this day, some people in this room know directly that this repression is still going on. Um, but we need to write about it, publish, um, publish um, books about it, examine um, why we are doing what we should be doing, and uh, you know, laws are not always uh, the correct thing. And so uh, we were putting on a conference every year, and one. One of like or a few of the, the foundational principles that Creative Animal Studies has really integrated um, and has been beating the same drums globally uh, um, from Latin America to Colombia to um, Australia, etc. We have Creative Animal Studies chapters um, in all the continents except for Antarctica. Um, so penguins are not down for that yet. Um, but uh, we've been having conferences every year, small, big, uh, but we are rooted in anarchism. Uh, we're rooted in intersectionality. We do have some people that have come to our conferences um, saying what's the point of intersectionality, it's all about the animals, and I'm um, sorry if you are thinking that at this conference, that's not uh, the case. Um, we do have uh, panels that are specifically on indigenous issues and that don't speak to veganism or animal rights um, at all. And we sometimes have panels on black liberation or queer issues that don't speak at all about animal rights. As long as um, we're not oppressing another movement um, or marginalizing another movement, what we're trying to do is create an intersectional, real intersectional space. So feel free and comfortable to talk about issues and not always bring it back to non-human animals. Um, because uh, we believe that one, you know, kind of total liberation. So when one is oppressed, all are oppressed. Um, and so the third kind of tenet is total liberation and making sure that you can wear anything at this conference. You, uh, um, and it's not a ridiculous question. We get it every year at every single continental conference. What should I wear? Wear what you want to wear. Um, and uh, we don't want to be academics. Um, we're, we want to be scholars. And so there's a difference between a scholar and an academic. A scholar is you know, can be on the streets, they can be a community center, um, an academic is an institutional scholar. And uh, so people that present are high school students, middle school students, college students, activists. Um, I was talking to a few people last night. The first uh, um, uh, critical animal studies conference was at University of St. Thomas in Houston. 
And uh, in Houston, we had the American Indian Movement um, on the same panel as a former Black Panther Party member, um, as uh, somebody representing the Zapatistas, and then we had somebody that was representing um, the Earth Liberation Movement, and then somebody representing the Animal Liberation Movement. And that's what we kind of um, strive to focus on. And then our next panel was um, queer and disability, uh, and you know identity politics, which is really, really important to us. And some people don't get that. Um, and we really want to emphasize that, so please hold on to these values, um, and we don't want people co-opting it. That's what we brought to the animal liberation movement. And some people say, what has ICAST done? We brought total liberation and intersectionality um, to the movement. Um, you know, 16 years ago. Um, and so we've been beating that drum ever since, and we've been respectfully, you know, challenging people why these issues are really important um, in the streets as well as uh, in, you know, scholarly forms. And um, during lunch, we can talk about the details on how we've done that successfully and how we've done that in a really punitive kind of fashion. And we have to learn and take accountability. So again, this space, um, is a safer space, it's not a safe space, there's no such thing. Um, but be respectful, this is not a place to hit on each other. Um, this is not a place to try to hook up. This is not a place, it's a sober space. Um, and try to be respectful of that. Uh, and please make sure, um, if there is a problem, um, ask other people, don't always ask me. Um, I'm not, I might not be your ally, um, or look like an ally to you, so, um, go around and kind of create the space, but understand, um, not everyone understands what feminism and disability and queer issues and black liberation and indigenous rights are and decolonizing it. So it's a learning of space. And so let's learn together, let's provide space for each other and understand um, it's okay to take accountability in this space. So if you've done things in the past, if you've done things now, um, let's like be a transformative uh, uh, space as well. Does that make sense, everybody? Awesome. Uh, so it's really, a, you know, uh, if you need to walk around for people with disabilities, if you need to twitch, if you need to shake, um, if you want to yell every so often, just let everybody else know so we're like clued in, not that, you know, we're going to marginalize. I have disabilities, I'm really proud of it. Um, so uh, just be proud of who you are. And if you're queer, if you want to come out, that's awesome for the people that are, don't feel comfortable coming out. Um, this is a supportive animal liberation front organization. Um, we support the ALF, so um, we support the ELF. Uh, you can get zines and books and uh, information on Save the Kids, and we have a table for the Black Student Union back there. So um, hopefully you understand why we did, because we're intersectional. Uh, so that's pretty much a sum up of ICAST Critical Studies. I just wanted to kind of get that uh, framework going, um, and hopefully everybody has come far and wide from around here, and hopefully you all build community and friendships and uh, safer space. So thank you so much for everyone coming out, and it's a free conference, so um, take pictures um, if you feel comfortable in doing so, but if you can right now, raise your hand if you do not want your picture taken. Okay, I know that's an ableist question, but um, you can wiggle too. Okay, cool, so it doesn't seem like nobody wants their picture not taken. Um, if that changes, which you can change at any point, um, just let people know. Um, does that make sense, everybody? All right, beautiful. Thank you so much, and I will pass it on to uh, Caitlin to introduce the panel. And we have Winter. Okay, we need my log in. It's just. What?
and economic production. And so Stuart Hall makes this argument that in contemporary capitalism, it's often hard to get a really deep analysis of what politics are really emerging, what values people really have, but that culture serves as a lens to actually get deeper into a discussion on our hidden assumptions and values in our world. So, for instance, if you do polling right now and you ask people about race issues, for the most part, very few people will openly admit to racial biases and preferences. But if you look at media and culture and what people consume, we see multiple versions of clearly racial uh, bias in what people want to consume in media. And so through reading and analyzing culture and media, you actually get a deeper understanding of what people's actual anxieties, fears, and politics are than you might get through traditional readings of politics. And so Stuart Hall kind of creates this method and mode to understand how you can kind of use culture to understand politics in a much deeper sense. And with this, there's also a general kind of critique slash complication of the general narrative, which is that culture only serves as a tool of ideological conformity. So if anyone here has ever read people like Gramsci, he makes this argument that culture is merely a tool of the governing elite to brainwash us into some form of political position. And Stuart Hill complicates this by saying that that is true and that's a part of culture, but culture also is much more nuanced and complicated and there are these subversive elements even within contemporary culture. And with that, people do not just rewatch all culture, they selectively choose different versions. And so we can almost see which ones people go to to get the sense of not just what people are being, but to probably see what people believe. So if everyone is going to see certain kinds of movies, it tells you about what views people actually have. And so they're both shaping culture by purchasing tickets and promoting a certain value and being indoctrinated by a system of cultural production. And so it's kind of complicating this. Um, and lastly, there's a value of the counter-narrative, of reading culture in a subversive way, of creating counter-cultural productions that undermine or subvert the traditional narratives that we have of culture. And a lot of the work that we look at is doing that. Um, and when it comes to animals, not surprisingly, Um, when it comes to animals, this value of using it as a media tool, as an educational tool, and as a kind of a subversive project actually works incredibly well. So in the first part of the book, we look at uh, pedagogy and superheroes. And this is an image from a really phenomenal comic series called The Liberators, which is about animal liberation. And it follows two, two normal heroes who liberate animals from factory farms and medical labs. And as we can see, also engage in arson as a tactic to shut down the production of our the exploitation of animals. And in one of our chapters, John Benacci, who will be speaking tomorrow, looks at the way he's used this in classrooms. And so in that work, he talks about the ways in which you can use something like The Liberators or Animal Man or these other comic series to get into and talk about deeper critical animal studies topics in a way that students actually find more accessible and linked to in a much more nuanced way. So in that chapter, he kind of highlights the fact that when you talk about animals, and if people here have educated or worked on these topics, students tend to be really hostile to animal issues when first brought up. But what he finds is that when you kind of have this discussion of their theory and the ideas, and then you go through these cultural lenses, people actually start to open up more quickly to open discussions of animal-related topics. So in this chapter, he talks about how you can use comics to engage with critical animal studies discourses. Um, and then, the next chapter on pedagogy we have is actually on how you can use uh, discussions around film, comics, media with children. And the argument that Joe makes in this chapter is that children are consuming this media anyway, and part of being an a parent is finding ways to turn and educate that in a way that makes it subversive. And so we provide some tools and discussions for thinking of how to read these topics in a subversive way for children. Um, so the next section, the, one that, the section that I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, since it's the ones I'm more working on, 
is the reading of cast into comics and the cultural studies film stuff. So for those who don't know, comics have a long history of actually engaging with animal rights issues. Um, the first one, the one on the right here, is from the 1972 comic uh, titled Wood God, and there's a chapter on there. It's one of the first animal-related superheroes in the Marvel world. And the entire comic is about animal experimentation, the dissection, of military industrial complexes, abuses of animals, and the way that it links to human oppression. And that's in 1972, well before actually a lot of these concepts were even brought fully into um, the academic analysis of animal studies. Um, and the second one is this piece from the 80s called Puma Blues, which takes an eco-nihilist or eco-pessimist account of humans and then engages with the destructive component of human life on non-humans and engages with what it means to actually promote a different kind of perspective on there. But what I really want to highlight here is that these two, as well as this is a, a cover from the comic Animal Man, in which in this issue in 1988, he breaks into an animal lab which is experimenting in primates, removes the animals, and then him, some activists burn down the lab. Um, and then there's a debate over the value of arson as a tactic for animal liberation. Um, and then lastly, there's another kind of really great example. This is the comic We Free, which tells the story of four animals who are experimented by the medical or by the military and turned into weapons, who then turn on the military industrial complex and try to take down the military component of animal experimentation. And so all of these kind of are stories about what it means to be a hero and give a different account than we generally culturally hear of heroism. Um, and one of the main values of comics and one of its cultural roles is it produces a sense of what it means to be a hero in contemporary political life. And so when you read these comics, if you use them in class, you use them with children or people growing up, you get an ability to focus and develop an account of heroism that actually is non-species, is non-anthropocentric, um, and is intersectional. Because all these accounts are works that engage with intersectional analysis. So I want to go into the section that I was more involved in, and that is, oh, sorry, one last one example for what it means to be a hero that comes from the book. I don't know if anyone here has seen the film White Gods, but it's a film about a dog uprising in Hungary that focuses on the animals not in an anthropocentric way. They don't talk, and they don't engage like humans. So both that and the previous one, We Free, also engage with the idea that animals and human, non-human animals will have different ways of thinking about the world, and they do not attempt to anthropomorphize them. Um, so White Gods is another really phenomenal film that talks about what it means to be a hero, what it means to be a leader in a way that is not human-centered. Um, which is a really kind of a unique read. So the last section of the book focuses on critical discussions of culture itself. And there's three different chapters on there. The first one focuses on race and animality in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And it's a series that I sadly have not read or seen. Um, I'm like the only person. Um, but it, you know, in that, it talks about the first Slayer, the way it's the, that the one primary female character is animalized in a specific way, and then goes into larger discussions about how Buffy's whiteness gets tied to some of these issues. And then it also looks at the, the few episodes that focused on pets or consuming of animals, um, and shows how the whiteness and race gets constantly brought up in Buffy the Vampire Slayer when animal issues come up. Um, the other chapter that looks at film and media analysis looks at Batman, and looks at the relationship and the way it uses his connection to bats in the film as a way of naturalizing him and removing his connection to um, the military industrial complex. So as Batman gets more and more militarized in the, in the movie series, he gets more and more surrounded by bats to kind of remove that cyborg, non-natural component to him in this reading. Um, and with it, he talks about the fact that, if anyone here has seen Batman, Batman's primary superpower is he's rich and white. And so it engages with that, that's his real power. He's a billionaire who owns a military company. That's really what separates him from everyone else. And so it looks at those dimensions and then the way in which he kind of exploits this link and connections to, to bats as a way of kind of hiding that narrative. And then also how most of the villains are also, talks a little bit about it, 
in the Batman world, a lot of the villains are connected to animal rights issues. So you have the Penguin, who most people don't realize is part of his work is animal liberation. He's done work for uh, freeing and fighting for birds. Catwoman has teamed up with animal liberationists to raid and remove animals from medical labs and has been stopped by Batman for trying to do so. Poison Ivy is kind of defined as an eco-terrorist who fights for Mother Nature at the extent of fighting against Gotham or against civilization. And so there's a really interesting reading of Batman with both defender of civilization as someone, and as someone who wraps himself in the imagery of bats to protect kind of that narrative. Um, and lastly, the chapter I did, which I feel most comfortable talking about since it's what I wrote, was on Rocket Raccoon and the concept of toxic masculinity. And so if anyone's seen the Guardians of the Galaxy film, what I argue is that Rocket Raccoon, if you look at queer theory and animal critical and studies, as something that blurs these boundaries between natural and artificial, between human and non-human, he is generally viewed as a queer, he should be viewed as a queer figure. He's a queering all these different aspects. If you look at like um, the original sidebar of work, um, if anyone knows the Turing test, for instance, it's based off of the imitation game, which is a queer kind of performance around gender. And so he based it off these original ideas around queerness um, as, a, as a gay man. And so I argue that Rocket Raccoon, in the cultural sense, should be read as queer, but he's not. And I argue the reason he's not is he uses these projections of toxic masculinity to construct a narrative of himself that, that hides that fact in the, in the movie. So he uses uh, ableist jokes, he uses gender-based jokes, he mocks people for their physical appearance, for their lack of sexual like, attractiveness, for their intelligence, etc., all in order to hide his own vulnerability and his whole own confusion. And I make the argument that this is done for the audience who was unwilling, or maybe the studio felt was unable to engage with an actually openly queering figure in this work. And so instead they formed him into this very toxic masculine block to create a barrier. Um, and so, overall, um, I kind of wanted to have the last picture since the Thor movie just came out. This is Thor as a frog, <laughs> which, um, in the comic world, there was a huge backlash against Thor becoming a woman. So I don't know if people are following the comic world. Thor became a woman because a female was able to pick up Thor's hammer, and that's all it takes to be Thor. In an earlier episode issue, a frog was able to pick up the hammer and became Thor. And so it's really interesting that everyone kind of went, there was a huge backlash against Thor becoming a woman, but no one really cared when Thor became a frog. It's kind of an interesting <laughs> narrative. But overall, what I want folks to realize and kind of come across for the book is that if you're part of the job of doing critical analysis studies work, in my mind, is engaging with this critical component. So there's a lot in this conference, a lot on the tables and the books we publish on activism, on social justice, on tactics like that. And I think those are really, really important. But I think it's also important to kind of link that narrative to an actual discussion on culture. Most people's engagement with politics is not with political organizations or social movements or things like that. It's through their engagements with generally broader popular culture. More, you know, it's either through television, through Netflix, through movies, through music. And I think that as a topic and as a field, the Animal Studies Project is only further advanced and helped when we start to do this critical engagement with cultural production and start producing our own counter-narratives to speciesist production. Um, so I'll stop it there since we're really Cool. So um, 
I want to start my presentation with a little perceptual exercise. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. Um, and I want you to imagine that this room is a pool of water. And we're all in this pool of water and we're just kind of floating around in this pool of water. And you can feel the water against your body, against your skin. And, um, you know, just kind of floating around in there, feeling the water against your body. And now I'd like you to imagine that from that feeling of the waves of the water against your skin and your body, you can tell how big this, this room that we're calling the pool is. You can tell, you know, where the bottom of the pool is. You can tell where the ceiling is. You can tell where all the other beings in the pool are. You can tell about those beings. You can tell, you know, more or less their size, their you can tell things about their personality, you can even tell things about their background. Only from the feeling of the waves of the water um, against your skin. So um, now, I'd like you to open your eyes. And the fact is, what you just imagined is what you were doing every moment of the day, um, if you had vision. Because with your retinas, you are gathering information from waves of light. Light is waves. Um, Sean, I'm going to ask you to tell me how I can forward to the next slide. <laughs> so, we are surrounded by waves in the form of the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, so, we have um, Long waves, which you know, if you listen to the FM radio, those are actually waves that are picked up by the radio. And um, you know, you go get an x-ray, if you're not feeling good, those are waves that are recorded by a device and then spit out as an x-ray. And right there, that tiny little segment right there, is what, if you have vision, you can perceive with your eyes. It's called the visible light spectrum, and we perceive that as color, okay? Tiny, tiny, tiny little fraction of all the waves that we're surrounded by. Our, our visual perception is actually a very small portion of this, of this sea of waves that we live in. Other species, dogs for example, see a different spectrum of color than we do. So, for example, dogs, see ultraviolet light, and they see red differently than we do, okay? So our visual perception is really just a very limited perception of what's around us. That is the human perception, if you can see. Um, and other species vary greatly. So chickens, um, I would love to see the world as chickens do. Chickens see ultraviolet light and they see infrared light. As an artist, it would be such an amazing thing for me to be able to perceive that. And they perceive the colors that we perceive, red, green, blue, cyan, they perceive them with much greater nuance than we do. So this is a photograph of Kelsey. And um, she was rescued at a young age and spent the rest of her life at Harvest Home Animal Sanctuary, where I took this photograph. These are photographs of a battery cage facility where Kelsey spent all of her life before she was rescued. She was crammed into one of these cages, along with five to seven other hens, so that each one had less rusted cage to stand on than this sheet of paper. To prevent injuries in such confined conditions, her beak was painfully seared off when she was just a chick with no anesthesia. The cages are on the second floor, so above the pictures on the right is where the cages are, and um, so that the waste falls to the first floor, where it's only cleaned out periodically, so even when I visited this facility a year later, the smell was toxic. Kelsey was starved for extended periods until she lost 25 to 35% of her body weight to stimulate egg production. 
Also to stimulate egg laying, artificial light was alternated with periods of darkness. And this for a being who sees colors, more colors, and greater nuance in color than we do, kept in the dark. And yet these are all standard industry practices. In February of 2012, Kelsey, along with 50,000 um, other of the other hens who were imprisoned in this facility were abandoned by the owner without food or water. More than two weeks later, state officials discovered 17,000 hens dead, and they began gassing the others. At last, animal sanctuaries were able to negotiate to take custody of the survivors, and 4,460 hens were rescued. But even if she had not been abandoned, Kelsey would have been gassed or slaughtered when she no longer produced enough eggs to be profitable at one to two years old, which is much younger than her natural lifespan. I first photographed the facility a year after the rescue, which inspired my current photographic series, Censored Landscapes. It consists of landscapes that include sites of animal agriculture, and it's still a work in progress. I've been inspired by photography since I was a kid. I love the work of Louis Hine, Henry Cartier-Bresson, Dorothea Lange and the Forest Securities Act photographers, Ansel Adams and the X64 group. And I want to carry that torch and use the photographic aesthetic and photographic strategies to invite people to see what they'd otherwise not see. I think Dougald Hine, co-founder of the Dark Mountain Project, said it well when he said, Art gives us just enough beauty to stay with the darkness rather than to flee or shut down. American landscape photography has evolved in conjunction with the conservationist and environmental movement. It's been predominantly the domain of white male photographers from Carlton Watkins to Ansel Adams to Robert Adams. In the late 20th century, landscape photographers, particularly those associated with the new topographics movement, explored the human presence in the landscape. But non-human animals have almost entirely been ignored despite their enormous numbers. Over 70 billion land animals and trillions of marine animals are slaughtered every year for food. In the photographs where no animals are visible, I plan to indicate their presence with the number that have been or continue to be confined there. As you might imagine, these numbers have been difficult to obtain. The industry has a vested interest in suppressing the awareness about the reality of these places. They've attempted to pass ag gag laws that criminalize photographing sites of animal agriculture in more than half of US state legislatures, and they have passed in seven states. The Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act is a federal law that criminalizes the economic damage to an animal enterprise enterprise, in, including loss of profits. This law is so vague and broad that journalists and photographers who expo expose the practices of these corporations can be prosecuted as terrorists. This facility has applied to increase their numbers to $600,000, $600,000, 600,000 hens this year. The exclusion of animals from landscape photography reflects their exclu exclusion from environmental activism. Though environmentalists have fought courageously against the fossil fuel industry, the movement has almost entirely ignored animal agriculture, which is responsible for 18 to 51 percent of greenhouse gases, more than all the transportation in the world. Animal agriculture is a leading cause, if not the leading cause, of climate change, deforestation, ocean acidification, habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity, and mass species extinction. Our society nurtures a nostalgic view of so-called family farming, but the fantasy that seven, people, seven billion humans, estimated to grow to nine billion by the year 2050, can be fed an animal-based diet without economies of scale is ignorant, regressive, and elitist. Though they charge higher prices, these farms have to compete with industrialized farms. So they also breed animals, confine them, and slaughter them long before their natural lifespan. There is no right way to do a wrong thing. Growing crops, crops to feed animals to feed humans is grossly inefficient. 70% of crops grown in the U.S. are fed to livestock. Crops raised to feed livestock consume 56% of the water used in the United States. 
And raising animals for human consumption also requires much more land than growing plants. Grain grown by impoverished people is fed to livestock that feeds humans at astonishingly low prices, subsidized by the government. 99% of all meat, dairy, eggs, and fish comes from factory farms. Farms that call themselves cage-free, free-range, organic, family-owned, grass-fed, sustainable, or my favorite, humane, certified, claim to be better. But investigations of cage-free egg farms, for example, expose such crowded, filthy conditions that birds are crushed to death or buried alive in their own feces. The term free-range has no legal definition and is effectively meaningless. Organic animal agriculture is just as speciesist and in some ways even more environmentally destructive than conventional animal agriculture. Organic egg production requires at least 20% more feed, which means more land, water, and other resources. Organic or not, animals produce a lot of poop, but in most cases the law does not require that the waste be treated. In the U.S., farm animals produce 130 times more waste than humans. A farm with 2,500 dairy cows produces the same amount of waste as a city of over 400,000 people. Durango, for example, has a population of 18,000. So we're talking 20 times the amount of excrement as this city. Dangerous air, water, and soil pollutants come from this and is directly blamed for the growing marine dead zones. 80% of all antibiotics used in the U.S. are fed to farm animals. The use of antibiotics has caused some bacteria to become antibiotic resistant, increasing life-threatening staph infections like MRSA in humans. But instead of addressing the problem of eating animals, the pharmaceutical industry profits from masking and medicating the unhealthy effects of our diets. The, the majority of Americans now suffer from overconsumption. consumption Human consumption of animal products has been closely linked to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and other disease. And now that we are living much longer than ever before, the effects of a lifetime of consuming animals are worse than ever. Animal agricultural workers are barely paid subsistence wages and work under appalling conditions. They are mostly recent immigrants and people of color, who have to support families on minimum wage, no benefits, and little job security. They are constantly exposed to toxic substances so that the rate of illness and Ill injury is among the highest of any injury. Last year, Oxfam reported that workers on processing lines and chicken facilities have to produce at such high rates that they are denied bathroom breaks and have to resort to wearing diapers. And yet, corporations that pop profit from the production of chickens chickens want to continue to ramp up processing from the current rate of 140 birds per minute to 175 birds per minute. These are the same industries that ranked in the top 10 for severe accidents that resulted in amputations or hospitalizations. A study by Professor Amy Fitzgerald at the University of Windsor found a strong correlation between the presence of a slaughterhouse in a community and high crime rates. Higher rates of domestic violence, substance abuse, severe anxiety, and PTSD have also been reported among animal agricultural workers. You have to wonder, what does it do to someone to kill all day long? In this country, animal agriculture is a result of colonization. Cows, pigs, sheep, goats, and chickens were brought to the American, Americas by the Europeans. Indigenous Americans relied on agroecological methods. For example, many native tribes in North, Central, and South America cultivated the three sister crops, corn, beans, and squash. These three plants have a synergistic relationship that requires no additional fertilizers, minimal water, and deters pests. These three plants also provide all the nutrients necessary for humans to thrive without the consumption of animals. As with the egg industry, the dairy industry particularly exploits the female reproduction, reproductive system. A calf in the dairy industry typically spends the first two to three months of life all alone in a small stall. 
As soon as she is old enough to become pregnant, she is artificially inseminated. Among dairy industry workers, the colloquial term for the enclosure used to restrain her during, the, during this process is rape rack. Her calf is taken from her within hours after birth so that her milk can be sold for human consumption, causing great distress to both mother and baby. Mastitis is a painful infection of the breast that is common in the dairy industry. When a cow no longer produces enough milk to be profitable, she is sent to slaughter, typically when she is only four to five years old. Her natural lifespan span is 25 years. Artificial insemination is also standard industry practice in the pork industry. For most of her adult life, a sow is imprisoned in a metal crate so small that she cannot turn around. She will chew on the metal bars, wave her head incessantly, and show other signs of insanity. Then she and her piglets are put in a metal farrowing crate while she is lactating, also not large enough for her to turn around. Then her piglets are taken from her, and she is again artificially inseminated. I took this photograph in the desert on a day that was so hot that it was just after 20 minutes of being out of my air-conditioned car, my face was bright red and I felt light-headed. But these animals are out there all day, every day, with no shade and only water from a dirty concrete tub to drink, either because of their vast numbers or because they are hidden away in warehouses or isolated areas. Our ability to see them as individuals is obliterated. Ecofeminist scholar Carol J. Adams uses the term absent referent. Just as women are made absent reference, for example, when our perspective is marginalized or ignored, or when we are sexually objectified, animals are made absent reference when their bodies are commodified. The exploitation of and violence toward women and animals are rooted in the same system of dominance. Photography for me involves a process of research and discovery. I know for some of you the information I, I am presenting seems elementary, but it is important for me to connect it visually to what the truth of these forms are. This project has been deeply informed by ecofeminism. As ecofeminist scholar Marty Keel wrote, the term ecofeminism was embraced by feminists in the, in the early 1970s who welcomed the widening of feminist concerns to the larger natural world. The connections between workers, human health, the environment, and animals are the essence of ecofeminism. Another idea spawned by feminists is intersectionality. The term was introduced by law professor Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. But the concept was in existence by the late 1960s when our ethnically diverse feminists observed that oppression experienced by minority, disabled, or poor women is different than that experienced by white middle class women. The intersectional experience of oppressions is more powerful than the sum of oppressions including that of non, I'm sorry, the oppressions that in fact impact an individual. Ecofeminism and intersectionality suggest that all forms of oppression, including that of non-human animals, exist within a system of domination. Resistance to oppression must be in response to all forms of oppression, including sexism, racism, classism, heteronormativity, colonialism, ableism, ageism, environmental destruction, and speciesism. Women, especially women of color and indigenous women, are at the forefront of a better way of approaching agriculture. For example, Navdanya is a women-centered movement for the protection of biological and cultural diversity. They form a network of seed keepers and organic producers in India. Mia Kayoto Seed the Commons is an organization in San Francisco, San Francisco that works to create sustainable and just food systems without the exploitation of animals. The word miyakayoro can be translated as the way of the milpa. Milpas are the traditional form of Mesoamerican agriculture in which corn, beans, and squash are cultivated in an integrated manner. The word miyakayoro comes from Nahuatl, 
a Mesoamerican indigenous language. Mia Coyote Seed the Commons will be holding the third annual People's Harvest Forum from December 9th through the 11th. I've been at all of their conferences. I'll be there in December. I would love to see you there. Truly an intersectional organization. The Indigenous Women of Americas, Defenders of Mother Earth Treaty Compact, was signed on September 27, 2015, by women of indigenous tribes that include the Ponca Nation, Cree Nation, Yaqui, Choctaw, Cherokee, Quechua, and Sapara. So I would like to end my presentation with a very inspiring quote from that compact. We invite all the women of the world to join us, your indigenous sisters of the Americas, to put a stop to the destruction. We are drawing the line, and we are saying that the harms stop here and now. No more fossil fuel infrastructure or extraction. No more genetically modified organisms. No more toxins in our water, soil, and air. And no more commodifying and privatizing of the earth, air, water, soil, and natural systems. And I would add to that compact, no more commodifying and privatizing of sentient animals. Thank you very much. Sean, you have a laptop? You don't have a laptop?
Okay, cool. I can just do it like this then. Yeah. All right. Apologies. No worries. I guess it's pain. <laughs> Okay, can everyone see my uh, slides now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. Well, sorry for the delay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to thank the organizers and uh, as well everyone in the audience for coming. It's a real honor to be here. I've been involved in uh, ICAST for uh, many years, and it's always nice to still be here. Problems? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, so my name is Drew Winter. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at Rice University. And I'm talking about uh, meatless infrastructures in Denmark, or something that I uh, call in a more general sense, infrastructures of activism. And what I mean by that is that infrastructures are things that we tend to not think about when they function well. And I think that that's important uh, within the context of uh, vegan advocacy and within reducing, our, uh, reducing the population's consumption of animal products. Because I think that we have a tendency in the animal rights movement to think in uh, very ethical terms, in terms of sort of uh, Western analytic philosophy and moral consistency. And what I want to do is sort of talk about why that, while, while I agree with the conclusions of that as a uh, ethical argument, that that needs to not be the basis for our outreach and our activism and our pursuit of a uh, real world uh, that is free of exploitation of non-human animals. And this is based on my doctoral dissertation field work in uh, and around uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. So uh, I'm going to go pretty fast because uh, we're running short on time through uh, my own research. Basically, I'm an anthropologist, which means that I'm interested in understanding, uh, I'm interested, interested in understanding culture and the ways in which people uh, sort of make sense, narrate, uh, develop uh, symbol, uh, symbolic systems, and uh, understand the, their own history and their membership as a part of a group. Uh, so, I've been in Denmark for 14 months, I'm leaving next week. I did about 100 interviews with uh, pundits, politicians, activists in the environmental and animal rights movement, uh, people at food NGOs, basically anyone who is somehow involved in the production of food in, in Denmark and also in the sort of restructuring of it in terms of food advocacy, environmental advocacy around meat production, as our last speaker illustrated. Um, uh, meat is a tremendous concern with climate change, and my specific question in my own research is about how this uh, this country, which, as I will explain, is uh, very invested in renewable energy and sustainability in many ways, uh, but also has a very strong history in terms of its meat production and consumption, how they're sort of uh, marrying these things in their imaginations, how people in the food industry and other Danes are, trying, are coming to grips with these sort of contradictions. And contradiction will be an ongoing theme in this presentation. So at first, I want to go through this real fast, but just so everybody is familiar, uh, Denmark is a small northern European country. It's, uh, it's what's called Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, basically. Uh, it's got, its society is basically what's called the Nordic model, which includes Finland, which means it is a, a capitalist country, but it is very, very heavily, uh, it has a very strong public sector, and the general understanding is that the state has a strong responsibility to take care of its citizens in terms of food, housing, shelter, education, and health care. Um, I think it's important to contextualize where this research is coming out of uh, because obviously that is going to determine uh, the sort of barometer, the sort of uh, scale at which we can intervene in the population. Uh, in, in Denmark's case, it's a very strong middle class, very high union membership and uh, a general sense of concern for uh, the state taking care of people. And uh, at the same time, it's still coming to grips with what is happening in the rest of Europe in that there is a very restrictive immigration policy and right-wing elements in the country are um, stoking fears of Islamophobia. And pork in particular has become sort of a political weapon by the right-wing in Denmark 
that is part of the sort of uh, political turmoil that I'm going to talk about. And also, just so people are aware, Denmark uh, technically has control over Greenland and the Faroe Islands, though they have local autonomy. And if anybody wants to ask me about that, we can talk more, but it's not really what I, uh, what I want to talk about. So, uh, every country has its own uh, sort of cultural history and imagination around meat, and Denmark is no exception. Part of the reason why I find Denmark a uh, very interesting uh, area to study is because it is a very politicized element of Danish culture. Uh, so Denmark is a, has been until very recently a very agrarian country, it's very flat, it uh, has a lot of farmland, and it was originally a big grain exporter and eventually retooled itself to become a large meat producer. It's currently, I think, the largest meat, uh, or pork export in Europe. And it is, uh, it's widely understood by many people, even though it is not financially true, that uh, the pork industry provides a lot to Denmark's economy. It, it really doesn't, but people think it does. And it has been mobilized by the political right wing uh, as a sort of marker of ethnic Danishness. The most strong example was a few years ago, a member of the Danish Folk Party, Danish People's Party, which is essentially uh, a right-wing populist party, tried to mandate that all public institutions like daycare centers would have pork in them. And the argument was ostensibly that this is about celebrating ethnic Danishness, it's about celebrating our history and our culture, but it was widely understood by the public to be a sort of dog whistle to attack uh, the Muslim immigrants who are a, a sort of bogeyman for the political right wing. At the same time, Danes are very aware of the fact that meat is a huge contributor to climate change issues. Um, they tend to think that it's not necessarily healthy, and they are aware of animal welfare issues. So on the other hand, left wing politicians have taken a vegan challenge, for example, and there have been suggestions by policy groups that the country have a greater tax on meat and uh, red meat in particular due to climate concerns. This is countered though by the fact that uh, agriculture is very, uh, it's, it's very, it runs very deep in Danish society and agriculture is very cooperatively organized in Denmark and uh, that is very good for the farmers and that they tend to do very well and they're not as exploited because they're co-owners in these large Danish companies, but that also makes them a very strong political lobby. So what I want to talk about today is examples of activism that are not necessarily by uh, animal rights organizations. Uh, they might be by people who have sympathies for animal rights, but ways in which uh, people are being thought of in terms of giving people access rather than throwing moral arguments at them in order to allow them to eat more vegan plant-based food. So I'm going to give you three examples here, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about why these, I think, are really important in ways that we can sort of expand on our strategic and tactical uh, toolbox to uh, move us towards an uh, animal exploitation-free world. The first example, as you can see here, this is uh, these are shelves that I took pictures of in local grocery stores in Copenhagen. Denmark is, uh, in terms, especially in terms of Copenhagen, has a lot of vegan options. And that is the result of the Danish Vegetarian Organization doing a lot of behind-the-scenes work with the major uh, retail stores, the major uh, grocery chains, and encouraging them to carry more vegan food and working with them. Now, obviously in the United States there is a growing uh, assortment of vegan aisles and vegan sections. But what I think is unique about this is that, as you can see with the sign on the left, these stores are actively marketing it. I've seen uh, ads like this one not even near the stores themselves. So it's really become a way to, uh, for, for the stores to stand out on their own and to encourage people. And what I like about this is that it's not just the material access to this food that gives people the option to eat more food, but it's actively being advertised. So it's, uh, it's, not, just, it's not just that it's there, but it's also that these, uh, these stores are making people aware of it. And this didn't happen because of their own internal research. This happened because of...